From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We are joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deccant. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this stuff they don't want you to know. We're coming to you somewhat live from a dark, stormy mid-morning here in Atlanta, Georgia. And, you know, one of the things I think we've all been thinking about in our crew is that history is a disturbing thing, right? Some things are further away than they seem. Others are much more recent than people, governments, and institutions would like to admit. I mean, just think about this, you know, April 1990 was more than 30 years ago. And as recently as the 1960s, Black citizens in the United States were legally prevented from voting. This struggle against institutionalized discrimination, racism, oppression, it continues today. And this struggle is often collectively referred to as the civil rights movement, the story of amazing people struggling against massive systemic forces hell-bent on making sure the practice of the law did not measure up to the promises it made. And there is something else to this story about civil rights in the 1960s. It's a twist you won't find in most history books. But first things first, here are the facts. Yeah, so I mean, just a little bit on, you know, what the civil rights movement is. I think probably most people are very familiar with this. But just to lay a little bit of groundwork in context, the civil rights movement is generally referred to a series of strategies and activities taken up by uh, many different groups in the United States between 1954 and 1968 in order to end racial segregation uh, and discrimination in the country while also uh, acquiring legal recognition for the rights that are already guaranteed under the Constitution. And, and again, as we can see, just by turning on the news today, we've still got a ways to go before those things are really and truly accomplished. But uh, it's, it's crazy how between 1954 and 1968, uh, so much work was done and uh, progress was made in, in a relatively short period of time. Um, and while the aims of the movement centered on justice for the African-American community, they also pushed for equal rights for people of all races. Yeah, it's astonishing when you think about it. Despite centuries of oppression through institutions uh, and through physical violence and more, a single generation was able to influence crucial legislation was able to uh, profoundly shift attitudes of a prejudiced culture. And when this generation is doing it, they didn't have the internet, they didn't have social media or any of the modern tools of communication that most people listening use every day. Yeah, we can't really overstate um, how important and crucial the internet has been in, in so many modern uprisings from the Arab Spring to what we're seeing now with the protests in the United States and across the world. Uh, so much sparked um, and proliferated by social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, videos, you know, live streams, the access to information instantly. That just wasn't the case in, in these days. So it, it's extra uh, impressive and just really astonishing at how much uh, was accomplished um, without those tools. Yeah, it really shows the importance of anyone who had a camera, who was willing to use that camera, you know, from 54 to 68. People who were willing to write words and release them in a publication about what was happening. The struggles of the civil rights movement then, they were going up against some intense issues. And just some examples of those if you look at what's known as the Jim Crow laws that existed in a lot of southern states within the U.S., these were laws that blatantly reinforced and propped up white supremacy within those southern states. And in particular, there was legislation that, was, that existed that did things like kept schools and other public places racially segregated. 
laws that tried to or attempted and uh, were effective in preventing black people from voting. There were things like polling taxes, literacy tests, and, you know, think about that, a literacy test in order for you to be able to cast your vote as a citizen of a country. And by literacy test, that's not like the quick red fox jumps over the lazy brown dog or whatever. That's that's uh, saying, hey, read this Mandarin, this thing literally written in Mandarin, or you can't vote. And, and honestly, even if it was more basic than that or, or something, you know, not obviously completely set up for someone to fail, I mean – you know, the folks that were being uh, forced to take these tests didn't have access to the same level of education that, um, you know, people of other races did. So it was set up to fail, even if you didn't push it to those egregious levels, you know? Yes. And, you know, as egregious as that is, there were also laws that would prevent you possibly from marrying the person that you love or that you wanted to marry if that person was not of the same race as you. Yeah, miscegenation, right? Yes, and and it is just, you know, it's unthinkable in these days, those kinds of laws. But that wasn't the only, these were, and by the way, these laws were struck down through the efforts of all of these people. Um, or at least, to the most part, the laws were stricken, but it doesn't mean attitudes fully changed, right? And it wasn't the only thing they were up against. Right, and there are, you know, now, here in 2020, we as a species are seeing the same patterns enacted again, like violence against citizens, right? That galvanizes communities and organizations to push for change. Uh, consider the case of Emmett Till, 14-year-old boy, a black child who's from uh, Chicago, traveled down to the town of Money, Mississippi to visit relatives. He was forcibly removed from his relative's home he was brutally beaten, he was tortured, he was ultimately murdered, and when this case received national attention in the media, it galvanized the movement. It got people out into the streets and into their communities. Then there's the issue, of course, like you mentioned, Matt, school segregation, specifically cases like Brown versus the Board of Education, and these are just a few cases. There are many, many more. These are just like some of the notable incidents that children are taught about, hopefully taught about in school today. Well, and not to mention things like the Ku Klux Klan uh, were, were essentially um, just so enmeshed within these power structures, like police officers in the South were often also members of the Ku Klux Klan, and their agendas would be aligned. Um, you know, they certainly wouldn't necessarily wear their, you know, Ku Klux Klan hoods while on duty, but then they would go carry out whatever maybe they didn't feel comfortable doing in their officers' uniforms after hours. You know, they would take the law into their own hands. Um, and, and, you know, I've talked about this on the show before, but the Watchmen series on HBO really does a fantastic job of, even though it's like a, you know, sci-fi comic book based type series, it does an incredible job of painting a picture of what this dynamic was like. And of course, these laws, the, these power structures, the, that's what they are. They're, they're power structures, right? Uh, they're, they're meant to uh, mandate the way an individual is treated by a society and mandate the way uh, an individual in a society treats other members of their own society. These, these are white supremacist power structures, and they are older than this country. Uh, the white supremacists here in the U.S. in the time of civil rights initially had a massive advantage. They controlled the media at the time. They controlled vast swaths of industry because originally they were the only people who could own the land, right? And who could own the businesses. And that naturally leads to them owning the government in, in practice, even, you know, even though that's not what it's supposed to be on paper if you read the legal documents found in this country. And these forces opposed to the push for equality during the civil rights movement, they did use all the levers of power at their disposal, legal and criminal. They wanted to squash the movement, and when possible, they wanted to terrify or vilify any allied non-black groups that may sympathize with people seeking equality. I mean, not just talking about 
other like groups that were out marching. We're talking about people who were listening to the radio or watching television at their house. They would be, you know, bombarded with headlines about, uh, about the dangers of unrest, right? It makes me think a little bit about like workers' rights, you know, struggles, like with, you know, union busting and things like that. And I only mention that because it's another example of if people in power have something to lose by some level of organization, they will do whatever they can to squash that uh, by any means necessary. And obviously this is much more of a human rights, you know, like it's a so much more deeply entrenched thing. It's more than just uh, controlling money and power. There is a deep seated hatred and racism in those in power that really fueled a lot of this behavior as well. Not just the money and not just the uh, idea of, controlling you know workers and, and things like that but um yeah i don't know i just i'm, I'm inherently distrustful often of, of 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 any anybody that has so much to lose you know by people asking for the right thing to be done um so i don't know it's it's a little easy to get disenchanted um, with all of this kind of stuff but it's also incredibly inspiring to look into the history of some of the groups and the individuals that really took this uh movement to to the next level and and created this you know blueprint for where we are now at least in terms of activism and and uh, not accepting this kind of status quo yeah one of the first groups you could look at were called the freedom writers it was a group that got together on may 4th 1961 a group group of people from varying walks of life different races who uh, left washington dc on a bus they were headed towards New Orleans, and along the way, there were actions taken on the bus that seem, you know, it seems very strange to, to talk about it today in 2020, but literally changing where they were sitting on the bus became a revolutionary act. There were white freedom riders who moved to the blacks-only section on that bus, and black writers who moved to the whites only section on the bus. And it was, um, it was something that angered people who, who knew that these, uh, meet these norms that were in place and these, uh, regulations were in place and they knew what they were doing was violating the norms, right? The, the, I don't, you, you can't really call them regulations, but the, the rules that were put forth, on that particular bus and in buses everywhere, uh, in, in especially the South, they knew what they were doing was perfectly legal. According to a recent Supreme court case or several Supreme court cases, but they also knew that there would be people who would be so angry that this action was being taken. They were just hoping that the government or they were testing to see whether or not the government would respond to help them, uh, just prove that these things you know, it does not matter where anybody sits on the bus. Yeah. Yeah. Because again, an eloquently written line or two of legalese feels good, right? It feels good to know that's real. But how much does it matter? It matters when it is enforced, right? It matters when it is upheld. So the Freedom Riders. You know, we're, we're, we're mentioning some groups, notable individuals. There, there are many, many, many more stories. We're just giving you a high-level look at civil rights in the 1960s. These people, like you said, Matt, they knew what they were doing was legal, but they did not know whether it would be enforced or whether the people who were supposed to enforce the law would indeed do their jobs. They knew their lives were on the line, and they were beaten the buses were, uh, you know, people were throwing stones at them. Their tires were slashed. More than 300 Freedom Riders were arrested during the trip. Uh, and it never finished its trip to New Orleans, ultimately. So that's, that's one group. Maybe we can talk about some of the uh, notable individuals associated with the movement. Where we record uh, in Atlanta, Georgia is often kind of referred to as um, one of the cradles of the civil rights movement. And that's largely because of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who is a Baptist minister and the first president of the Southern Leadership Conference, uh, or the SCLC, um, and, and, you know, considered probably the most prominent 
leader. Uh, but, you know, there, there, there's even discussion of her where he wouldn't have considered himself a leader. Like he was uh, jumping off of work that had been done by uh, others as well. And But he is, you know, history has sort of crowned him as being the leader of the civil rights movement. Just wanted to put that out there, um, that there were many leaders of the civil rights movement and he was just probably the most uh, front and center one. Uh, but uh, Dr. King was incredibly instrumental in executing nonviolent protests um, that sort of followed the uh, practices of Mahatma Gandhi and the idea of not meeting violence with violence and doing things like sit-ins and peaceful marches and, and all of that. And some of the most uh, famous events that he um, organized were the Montgomery bus boycott uh, and the 1963 March on Washington, which is where he delivered, of course, his uh, incredibly powerful and iconic I Have a Dream speech. Um, and he was in car, was locked up m- many times. Um, and for an extended period of time, when he was incarcerated for civil disobedience in 1963, he wrote um, one of his most famous uh, texts, which would be the uh, letter from Birmingham jail, where he included the famous quote, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Uh, and then in 1965, he began to speak out against America's involvement in the Vietnam War. And then in early 1968, Martin Luther King Jr. made his way to Memphis, Tennessee. It was, you know, you can get into the full story of this and it's probably an episode for another day. I believe we've talked about it on this show before, the the day of his assassination. I know we made a video about it back in the day. But he went to Memphis, Tennessee in support of sanitation workers there in the city who... uh, you know, their safety was at risk every day they were work and they were being severely underpaid for the work they were doing. And he went there to support them. He gave a speech on April 3rd, 1968. He was at the Bishop Charles Mason temple there in Memphis. And this is where you get his mountaintop speech. I would read a quote here, but there it's actually his words are very tightly controlled. So we probably should not include it in this, but you can look up the mountaintop speech and find all of the text there. What would, what is important to say here is that he seemed to, at the end of that speech signal that he was not going to make it to the end of, of the struggle of the civil rights movement and all of these movements that essentially he is a part of Uh, signaling that perhaps he wasn't long for this world. And the next day, on April 4th, 1968, he was shot on the second floor balcony of the the Lorraine Motel there in Memphis, Tennessee. A single bullet uh, shot in the face. And, you know, I think it's needless to say here, but that assassination um, is highly contentious in, in a lot of places and for very good reason. Yeah, the highly contentious is about the most diplomatic way to phrase that. A couple of points here. Uh, one thing that would be a profound, provable, factual illustration of institutions and power structures at play and how they work is that many of the same companies that fought against civil rights and definitely vilified leaders like Dr. King, especially uh, while he was alive, and, and government agencies too, uh, now they're the same institutions, the very same institutions that will cherry pick quotes and and put them up uh, because they want to appear to be doing the right thing. But don't forget, you know, it, it wasn't that long ago that those same institutions were trying to shut this person and this community and this movement down. You know what I mean? The FBI broke the laws that it made multiple times with Dr. King. And, and you know, that's that brings us to another notable figure, right? El Haj Malik El Shabazz, born as Malcolm Little, better known today as Malcolm X, spent 10 years in prison. And while within the prison system, he converted to the Nation of Islam. When he was released in 1952, he became a spokesperson for the Nation of Islam. And today he's credited for increasing the group's membership from 400 to an estimated 40,000 over just the course of eight years. Yeah, and and many of Malcolm X's messages uh, were 
a good bit different than those of, of MLK Jr. Um, because he didn't embrace the whole peaceful protest thing uh, nearly to the same degree. Um, he saw violence as, as absolutely a legitimate response to violence being done on, on his community. Um, and you can kind of sum it up in this quote where he says, if violence is wrong in America, violence is wrong abroad. Uh, if it is wrong to be violent, defending black women and black children and black babies and black men, then it is wrong for America to draft us and make us violent abroad in defense of her. And if it is right for America to draft us and teach us how to be violent in defense of her, then it is right for you and me to do whatever is necessary to defend our own people right here in this country. He said those words in November of 1963 during a speech in New York City. Um, a year later, he left the Nation of Islam and converted to traditional Islam uh, while on a pilgrimage to Saudi Arabia, to Mecca. Um, and uh, when he returned to the U.S., he had sort of ideologically shifted a bit and was a little more optimistic towards the idea of a peaceful resolution uh, to the fight for civil rights. Um, and you can sum that up in another quote that he made in uh, February of 1965. Yeah, he said, it is a time for martyrs now. And if I am to be one, it will be for the cause of brotherhood. That's the only thing that can save this country. And on February 21st, only two days after he said those words, he was at a New York City uh, ball or a place called uh, the Audubon Ballroom. And he was about to give a speech. He was preparing for that. And, you know, according to the official story, some members of the Nation of Islam, again, according to the official story, shot and killed him. And there, you know, there are, there are a ton of documentaries you can watch and books you can read about this assassination. Um, and again, same kind of deal. The official story is very contentious. That is extremely diplomatic of us to call it highly contentious. Uh, I want to recommend the autobiography of Malcolm X, which was published in 1965. It's Malcolm X with Alex Haley. Um, this This is a book that should be in your local school system. And, you know, if you're, if you wanted to watch Netflix, there's currently yeah, in 2020, as we're recording this in June, uh, a series you can watch called Who Killed Malcolm X. And again, you know, for many of our listeners in the audience today, this, this is hopefully stuff that was already, already very well known, right? But it turns out that there is more to the story of civil rights. It's something here in the U.S., it's something that doesn't get reported in uh, in a lot of school textbooks. It doesn't doesn't really get mentioned. Almost first, almost every single concept we have just mentioned has conspiratorial aspects of its own. And some of these, uh, like like the death of Dr. King, have been covered in previous episodes that we have done. And there are tons of resources out there. Uh, there are clear, there are clear uh, contradictions in the official story and then things that we know to be facts. And we can't make any mistake, you know. Um, Matt, you mentioned that, that idea about doc, the, the speech that Dr. King gave before the assassination. You know, you could interpret that also as saying, you know, this is bigger than one person, right? This is, this is bigger than me. And that's correct because uh, many people have died, but this movement, make no mistake, it continues and racism is is still shockingly apparent to anyone who bothers to explore modern statistics. But the civil rights movement had another ally. It was a foreign group halfway around the world, and they... Let us know if you think they wanted to help, because they wanted to at least appear to assist the struggle for equality, not because they necessarily cared about the concept of justice, but because they saw in the U.S. civil rights movement an opportunity to attack their greatest rival. Russia, you see, had hatched a movement all its own. And we'll talk about that right after a word from our sponsor. Here's where it gets crazy. Let's call this the Russian angle. 
The Soviet government then, as as the uh, as the Russian government does today, excelled in what are known as covert influence campaigns. You see, when you look at the the global context here, the beginning of the civil war coincides with the beginnings of what we refer to as the civil rights movement today. And the two became intertwined, both in how the USSR sought to exploit racial strife and how the Cold War itself propelled the cause of civil rights forward. This is, this is a fascinating story that should should be told more often. As far back as 1928, the USSR saw the stark racial inequality and divisions in the United States as an opportunity to weaken their primary rival in in what we know of as the Cold War today. Yeah, that's right. As far back as 1928, the USSR um, really looked upon this divide, this this uh, racial inequality and the struggle that it led to as an opportunity to weaken us as a, as a nation. So initially, like they, they had a plan and they had sort of like, a, I don't know kind of a smokescreen sort of altruistic cause that they were hiding behind uh, or at least using it as bait, which was the notion of pushing for self-determination in the what they called the black belt. Uh, in order to do this, they would recruit Southern uh, individuals of color who would be all about these aims. And, and a lot of this work came from something known as the common turn uh, or the communist international, which sought to spread the communist revolution Revolution around the world. Um, and in 1930, the Comintern escalated these goals, uh, the goals of its covert mission, um, and decided to work towards establishing an entirely separate black state in the southern United States, uh, which would kind of give them like a base camp and, and a, a base of operations um, to spread that communist revolution to North America. Yeah, no, that's an excellent point. The USSR deployed a tactic that is still still viable today and still used today, starting from an understandable point. Like let's create let's have a racially equal society. That that is who would have a problem with that? But then take take that movement and and co-opt it, begin to push it to become an uh, a vehicle for the aims of the USSR. In the Cold War. And this is, um, you know, this is like kind of a high level origin story, but there are notable, real concrete actions that this program took. Yeah, there are things here. It, it just seems, it seems like it's out of a comic book or something to me, the actions that were taken by the USSR in this time. And then some of them feel like, oh, well, that's just a good or right thing to do. But then there's this underlying wave of, you know, what we keep saying here of, of what the true intentions were. And by the way, we learned about this uh, part here from a an article in The New Yorker that was written by Jelani Cobb in 2018. It's called The Enduring Russian Propaganda Interests in Targeting African Americans. And if you look at that article, you're going to hear... Uh, a couple of stories or a bunch of stories of specific actions taken. And one of those was in 1932, when the Soviet government invited a group of black American artists, including the poet Langston Hughes, to go to Russia and to make a movie, to make a movie that could then be used as propaganda, uh, both internally within the United States and uh, externally to be sent out to other countries and used by the Soviet Union to show how terrible and wrong the United States was. And it's so tough because it was, I mean, it was, the, the, the situation was dire and, and terrible and it was going to be used against the country as a whole and the government in particular. And you, you said the magic word, Matt, propaganda, right? There was, there was something, there was, there was, the, we know from the evidence that the motivations of the Soviet government at the time um, were 
also based on what they perceived as propaganda value, and they were based on exploiting people for the economic benefit of the USSR. You know, follow the money. We have to remember, again, like when, when this stuff is initially happening, the 1930s are the height of um, what I find myself increasingly referring to as the first Great Depression. The, the Soviet Union advertised itself in real slick, real slick ads. Uh, we're a worker's utopia. We are free of all that ethnic, national, and religious division. History, of course, would prove that this was not true. But the propaganda worked. Um, so in addition to uh, luring thousands of white American workers, the program brought over African-American workers as well and also sharecroppers with the promise of the freedom to work and live unburdened by the violent restrictions of Jim Crow. Um, so in return, they were expected to help the Soviet Union build their cotton industry in Central Asia. Uh, several hundred um, individuals answered this call. And though many eventually went back or here's, you know, the kicker died uh, in imprisonment in the, in the gulags because they weren't cooperating to the extent that they were expected. Because again, this whole thing is not altruistic. It's a, it's a tool for, you know, capitalizing on people's, misfortune in an effort to just, you know, screw over the United States. Uh, it's, it's, it's the most opportunistic kind of uh, just callous thing I could really imagine during a time like this. And just going to give you another article here to read if you choose to do so. It's from the New York Times, written by Jennifer Wilson in 2017, titled, When the Harlem Renaissance Went to Communist Moscow. And there are proven conspiracies here, too. One particularly illuminating example comes from September 1957. The governor of Arkansas at the time with, uh, I don't want to make fun of him for his name, but his, his name was Orville Fabus. That's, it's just a weird name. He deployed the National Guard, the National Guard to keep nine children from integrating the Central High School there in Little Rock. This standoff was covered by newspapers around the world. And many of these newspapers, to their credit, pointed out this massive discrepancy, right? Not just, not just the discrepancy between what the law says and what the people who are supposed to be the law keepers do, but they noted the discrepancy between the values America was expressing and, and f spreading, in some cases forcing around the world, versus how it behaved at home. You know what I mean, and and this this was a great point. The Soviet uh, the Soviet factions take advantage of this opportunity. In Komsomolskaya Pravda, the a newspaper of a, a communist youth organization in the USSR, uh, it it ran this story that had a lot of photographs that were actual photographs. You know, this wasn't photoshopped or anything. And they were about this conflict. And they said with the headline, troops advance against children. That's just one, but we wanted to give you a specific source and a specific story. That sounds terrible, Ben. If I saw that headline, I would be shocked. <laughs> troops. It's like, it's like mean politicians murder old ladies. You know, like that's the equivalent. Uh, it's definitely shock and awe, right? Well, yeah. And just going to make a reference to headlines that are circulating today as we're recording this that are just as bad with the violence that's being carried out against protesters. But uh, let's, you know, let's just remember that that is happening now. That is our current situation. And let's jump back to the situation at hand here. Uh, the the propaganda push, you know, by the way, that was just one of the stories, right? The This is a common occurrence. It's, it's, happening over and over and over again as uh, as other events unfold. And the propaganda push led to international consequences for the United States. There were things that actually happened to us uh, because of the reporting. And again, it's the same deal. That It's right to report on that. But how it's used then can be called into question. So according to a legal historian, Mary Dudziak, 
uh, and this is a quote here, the Russian objective then was to disrupt U.S. international relations and undermine U.S. power in the world and undermine the appeal of U.S. democracy to other countries. And the propaganda was working. Oh, yeah. Because, because again, it started to impact the people in power. So once they were directly impacted, they started to care too. Diplomats and, you know, visiting countries across the globe, U.S. diplomats noticed that they were being increasingly questioned on the hypocrisy of the U.S. Like, yes, ambassador, I see your arguments about uh, capitalism and about, you know, democracy, but everybody in the world knows about your your country's record with this profound violence against people who want the same thing that you're saying you're going to give to us. And there's a there's a moment that history hinges upon here. There was a tour of Latin America. Richard Nixon was there. He was the vice president at the time. He wasn't yet president and he was he was, you know, going out for like a photo op, shake some hands, Makes make nice internationally, geopolitically, but he was greeted instead with protesters, all of whom were screaming Little Rock at him because they knew about this story. Yeah, and Secretary of State John Foster Dulles um, complained that uh, the situation was killing foreign policy. It was just really bad business. And that the effect that it was having on Asia and Africa uh, would ultimately be worse for us, the United States, than Hungary was for the Russians. Ben, with your international affairs background, can you unpack that for us a little bit? Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask I wanted to ask you all about this Um and like you said, Noel, that is an actual quote from the Secretary of State at the time. It sounds like their concern is much less, hey, maybe we should change something, and much more, well, this is uh, this is making the Cold War tougher for us. Yeah, we need to start controlling this narrative a little more tightly, guys. Mm-hmm. They're talking, and you know, they're talking about domestic violence in Hungary. Uh, and and how it played essentially they're they're saying everything but bad PR. It feels like that's what they were worried about more so than the the actual hypocrisy. But also, unless we make the mistake of thinking that this this operation, the series of operations, was uh, entirely altruistic, I think we pointed out earlier that uh, it wasn't. A lot of people also don't know this. Doctor Martin Luther King was the target of a KGB campaign as well. You know, the FBI tried numerous things to intimidate, to discredit, to smear, to depower, to kill Martin Luther King. To turn. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly, to turn Martin Luther King. But the KGB wanted to exploit him as well. They wanted to turn him into a political insurgent against D.C. And when he refused to play ball, He found himself in a terrible situation. Both the FBI and the KGB were after him. They were trying to undermine him at the same time. I can't imagine being in that situation. And again, like go back and listen to our episode on COINTELPRO. We have other numerous episodes where you can get more information um, just about some of that, you know, the FBI and other intelligence agencies involvement in in the civil rights movement. Well, yeah, and then like we like, like you know, I mean, this stuff is unequivocally real. These organizations are ruthless and uh, will stop at nothing to exploit their quote unquote targets or you know their assets or whatever. And they were both like kind of jockeying for uh, you know turning King and making him kind of like a tool for their ends. And then you know, as as you said, Matt, when he wouldn't play, uh, then he made a, a powerful powerful enemies on both sides. And, and I just you know, it just seems like. An absolutely uh, rock in a hard place type situation. Just, you know, wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. But all of this was moving uh, towards a bigger picture kind of end game. Uh, And we're going to talk about what that was and, and how things turned out after a quick word from our sponsor. We've returned. Here's a dilemma for those of us in the crowd who who might consider, you know, consider themselves 
staunchly anti-Russian, right? Not even anti-USSR, but a- anti-Russian in general. While this massive propaganda conspiracy was not created, let's be honest, not created out of altruistic or noble reasons, it played a huge part in the positive change that occurred in the country, right, Uh, in the U.S. I mean, in the 50s and 60s, the international pressure created by these propaganda campaigns motivated U.S. politicians to push through things like the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. And this, and you, do you know why they did that? They didn't do it because they said, hey, that's right, this is the right thing to do. These politicians and policymakers did this because they thought it was an issue of national security. It was a military motivation. American leaders made refuting the Soviet narrative about American racism a national security issue, critical for maintaining U.S. international leadership and promoting relationships with what was then called the Third World. And it wasn't a small impact either. Yeah, we've got this spe- a specific quotation here. This is on the legal record. The U.S. literally admitted what, what you said, Matt, it wasn't a backdoor conversation. In their amicus brief for Brown versus Board of Education, which we mentioned at the top of the show, they said the following. Quote, racial discrimination has an adverse effect upon our relations with other countries. Racial discrimination has furnished grist for the communist propaganda mills, and it raises doubts even among friendly nations as to the intensity of our devotion to the democratic faith. Oh, oh, that's a lot to unpack. Sounds kind of fanatical too, doesn't it? The I've never heard it referred to the, as the democratic faith. That's like very cultish sounding. And it's very much saying, Hey, the only reason we should maybe calm down some of this <laughs> systemic racism is because of the PR stuff that Matt was talking about earlier. If you really think about it, these moves against the United States, the the government and the system as a whole, like in an attempt to weaken, hurt the the power of the U.S., the end result here was that the Soviet Union improved the United States. Uh, it made it a better place. E- even if it was just incremental, it was noticeable and measurable. The positive change that their propaganda campaigns had on the U.S. So when you think about it, by attempting to weaken or destroy the United States, the USSR actually made it a better place. That That is one of the strangest, most important points to take away from this, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, whatever the motivation, right? We talked about the PR-ness of the whole thing and how, oops, we better do a better job because it's making us look bad to other countries. But then whatever the reasoning behind it is, it, it did affect some change. Uh, does that cheapen it? I don't, I don't know. It's hard to even look at it in those terms because any positive change in something as, as important as, as, as race, uh, racially charged laws, um, is going, is going to be a positive net result. Um, no matter what the people in power's motivations actually are, it's like we're going to change the hearts and minds. It's more like affecting something that's going to affect them and their bottom line or the perception of, you know, the government. Well, yeah. And, and while, while this international pressure certainly forced the hand to some extent of, you know, the power structures within the United States to at least uh, acknowledge a few things and, you know, make a few changes. It doesn't mean that it fixed everything. You know, the the international pressure was helpful, and I think it is in every instance where where other countries, especially countries that are so closely aligned or allied with, you know, a place like the United States, are going to force them, at least to an extent, to take action. And it again, it doesn't mean that it's all fixed now because, I mean, look what is happening in our world today as we're recording this. On June 5th, 2020, you know, the recent stories that have been coming out as we were, I'm just a little peek behind the curtain when we were preparing to record this, when we were writing this episode, the shooting of Ahmad Arbery 
had just happened. And, you know, look at what's happened over just the course. It was a, it was a course of a, a few days, I believe. Yes. Or it was a weeks. Well, it was, I mean, it was, it was a week or so. I mean, I don't know the exact timeline, but time is, is been feeling very compressed and or expanded lately, uh, depending on the day. Uh, and then stuff like this just adds to it, you know, in terms of like what even is time. But yeah, it, it, it got to the point where too, when I was seeing the George Floyd story pop up, I almost was confused. I thought it was referencing the other I can't breathe story. Uh, the gentleman who was held down for selling loose cigarettes, uh, in New York. Um, and then I realized, Oh, no, this is brand new. <laughs> and that's, and then everything changed. <laughs> I think that's a very good point. Um, I also think another way to look at it is you could say that nothing had changed, you know, right now, covert influence campaigns continue to date. The, the USSR is gone, right? Mm, debatably, we have an episode on that. But people will always use a tactic so long as it works. I believe, Matt, you had pointed out, um, you point out that the New Yorker verified this just a few years back. That's correct. Uh, just got a quote from, from the article from the New Yorker. And this is the article we mentioned before, the enduring Russian propaganda interests in targeting African Americans. And here, here's just a piece from that article. It just says, the Senate Intelligence Committee released two reports on attempted Russian interference in the 2016 presidential election, which highlighted how those efforts targeted African Americans. And uh, if you continue reading through, it discusses how half of the Facebook advertisements that were created by this organization called Internet Research Agency, or IRA, um, and these, you know, at least according to the article and according to intelligence, they were backed by the Kremlin and they were said to be influencing Americans uh, around the 2016 presidential election and what they were referencing in attempt to change the way people were thinking about that election. Uh, they were referencing race. And, and again, again, whenever, whenever you run into an organization that has like a bland, beige wallpaper kind of name like internet research agency or you know that's the same as like people for things right uh you you have to you have to watch out uh, but but of course the answer is obvious uh this the the goal if if your goal is uh destabilization or if you want to um if you want to push a large group of people in a specific way you go with what works. And the Internet Research Agency, the FSR, the Federated States of Russia, really, if we're being honest, does this because it works. And because it is true, it is true that there is enormous inequality. It's not like somebody over in St. Petersburg just had a light bulb moment and made this all up. And as you know, as that old meme says, modern problems require modern solutions. One, there there are noticeable differences between the old campaigns and the new propaganda conspiracies. Nowadays, your friendly secret Russian correspondents on social media are likely to play both sides, by which we mean the same people that are pushing out anti-Clinton messages in 2016, at the same time, those same organizations were pushing out anti-Republican messages. They were doing it on purpose. It's the same way that giant corporations often donate equal amounts of money to different political parties, depending on who can help, you know, because it, it depends from day to day who's going to be in power and who can help them and which thing is actually going to sway uh, positive change for them. So it's like hedging your bets, you know, there's really no ideological reasoning behind it. I would just say that the instances of corporations uh, splitting donations in, in that way, you're right, is to maintain their own power no, no matter who else is in power. In this case, it is to equally erode the trust that, you know, American voters or American citizens have in the system that supports them and the system that, you know, they pay taxes to. Um, and, and that seems to be why it's so effective in making everyone just feel like 
there's something wrong. However, in this instance, there is something wrong. So it, it, it's odd. It's it's just odd to to think about all of this. Uh, every everything that we've talked about today, it is is a strange thing to wrap your head around. And you know, I know a lot of us listening today are thinking about about the book Foundations of Geopolitics. Right? Uh, this this you know, there's a lot of debate about how uh, relevant or irrelevant the author is. Right and how much people are reading tea leaves here, but one of the one of the things we have to remember here is this is literally a conspiracy. It is a technique. It is a tactic, and it has an aim, and it is continued. It is continued unabated for nearly a century. The idea of this propaganda, and make no mistake, you, regardless of where you live regardless of what you believe, regardless of which social media platform is your favorite, you are the target. Uh, also, it's possible to say that the aims of these programs have become even more, if it was even possible, even more cynical. Uh, at least the Russian conspiracy of the civil rights movement was somewhat ideologically sound. They had a flavor of, 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 of positive ideological spin in it. They wanted to create a black state and they wanted to empower workers. And, but I don't know, man. I, I, I still feel like a lot of that was smoke and mirrors as well, just to like bait people into supporting their cause to destabilize the United States. Uh, but whatever the case might be, whatever you may think about that, inequality is, uh, in theory, the enemy of the communist revolution. Um, and yet, like democracy in the United States, communism in practice uh, fell far short from the ideas that they set out on paper. Um, communism in theory, we always say, sounds pretty great. Oh, everyone gets a piece. You know, you work hard, you, you get, you know, your fair share. That sounds great. What could go wrong? Well, I think it's the ultimate corruptibility of human beings that that goes wrong and that's the same thing that we see with democracy it sounds real great constitution's all well and good but you can't change everybody's worst instincts as human beings and power corrupts people and that's what we see time and time again um but I do think this is a fascinating story. Uh, and I actually want to thank Lauren Bright Pacheco, who I, I worked with some, some other shows and continue to work with. Um, she's the one who turned us on to this topic. Uh, it was something that her son had been really into and told her a lot about, and I'd never heard of it. And um, we discussed it uh, as a team and decided we wanted to check it out. So thanks, Lauren, for the, for the tip. Yeah, and there's certainly more to discuss here, but for today, we're going to have to end off here. We would love to know what you think about all of this. Um, are there, you know, are there articles or books or movies or facts or anything else that you want to alert your fellow conspiracy realists to? You can check out our Facebook group. It is called Here's Where It Gets Crazy. You can share all of that information, links there that are going to be helpful. You can reach out to us. We are on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. On Twitter and Facebook, we are Conspiracy Stuff and Conspiracy Stuff Show on Instagram. If you don't want to do that, you can always give us a call. That's correct. You can reach us anytime. We are one eight three three S T D W Y T K. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you. You have three minutes. Let us know if you do not want your name or your comments revealed on air. And if you hate the phone, then we have one more way you can always reach us, regardless of the day, the time, or the place. You can send us a good old-fashioned email. We are conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.